Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, Nos Vidar from the North Wales, where this is coming from. So working with your child at home, supporting learning is our theme today. This comes from a book I wrote a few years ago, Taking the Hell Out of Homework. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it came from my experience as a dad. I have three children, two of whom learn quickly and easily, and one who doesn't. And what I realized was that um, for two of my kids, a 20 minute homework would take them 10 minutes. And for my youngest daughter, a 20 minute homework could take her perhaps an hour. And uh, it all came to a head one day when she spent all this time doing her homework. And I said, you've got to stop now. And she said, okay, dad. When I went upstairs again to sort of say good night, she was working under the covers with a torch. She was so worried about it. So I started using some of the tricks of the trade as a Senko, as a special needs specialist, as a dyslexia specialist and it turned into this book. And the presentation I'm going to share with you has been made, I can't say all over the world, but it's been made all over the UK to school groups, parent groups. Uh, a lot of schools, when I do whole school training, will often will run this as a workshop for parents after school. It works particularly well if you bring your children with you. Obviously, we can't do that tonight. Um, I think where else I've done it, across Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore, lots and lots of places. And uh, all, all the problems are the same. And you know what? So are the solutions. So my hot tip, <clears throat> excuse me, is to make sure there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I really want to begin with the importance of talking to your school. What I've learned from doing this internationally is that many parents and many children are spending far too long on homework. The schools don't know this is happening and they don't want it to happen. So the first thing you need to do, I would suggest with great respect, <clears throat> is to go to your school and find out how long a piece of homework is supposed to last, and your school will know. And there are very clear guidelines, key stage one, two, three, four, how long a piece of homework should last. And it could be 10 minutes, it could be 15 minutes, it could be 20 minutes, <coughs> excuse me, whatever. Now you need to know this, because this is where you strike a deal with your child. And the deal is very clear, and this is what gives you, gives them hope which is that if they spend the allotted time, let's say 15 minutes, on their homework and they really graft, then it stops after 15 minutes. Wherever they've got to, however far they've got, you stop. And they know this. And the school will, by and large, be delighted with this. No school wants a child to spend an hour on a piece of homework. Now, you do need to talk to your school about it first, but I would tell them <clears throat> that your child will spend the allotted time quality time on that piece of homework and then they will stop and that is what they will get and i don't think there will be any problems at all um, this means that your child has a real incentive to um, work hard because there will be an end in sight and i'll also talk about various other strategies that we can use in order to to make this work now by the same token if your child um, misses you about and perhaps it, within that 15 minutes, spends five minutes looking for their pencil. Well, the clock stops, doesn't it? You know, and um, it starts again when they found their pencil. But this discussion with school about how long a piece of homework should last is critical. And I would suggest, with the greatest respect to my teacher colleagues, and I am a teacher, that if a homework which should last 15 minutes is taking your child, my child, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, then it's a badly set piece of homework. It is not appropriate for our child. So let's take that. Please go back to your schools and talk to them. Um, I've shared this view with teachers all over and no teacher in any school wants our children to spend longer than the normal period of time on their homework. And this is because, of course, stress is such a killer. We reckon that 80% of difficulties that we deal with are due to stress. Get rid of the stress, we minimize the difficulties. So if your child knows that homework, there's an end in sight, um, three 15 minutes homework is 45 minutes work, and then it's done, it's finished, it's dusted, absolutely. Very occasionally, you will talk to your school and you'll do this deal, and particularly in secondary school, there might be the odd teacher who doesn't quite get it, and you might need then to uh, intercede on behalf of your child. And the best person to talk to in a secondary school when this should happen is probably the year head. I know the instinct is to go to perhaps the Stenko, but I wouldn't. I would go to the head of year. I would go to whoever's the, running the pastoral side for your child because they will have the big picture and then they will liaise directly with um, subjects and they will make it clear um, what should be done. 
So let's go through some tweaks first of all, things, nice quick fixes that work for me. Quite a number of children, <clears throat> round about 30% of children and adults, find black font on white paper quite disturbing. And it can cause the print to swim, to swirl, it can cause it to move, it can cause all sorts of things. Now, it's really, really important to understand that this has nothing to do with dyslexia whatsoever. Um, if your child is dyslexic and you use an overlay as we have here, and it helps, then it's um, simply because your child couldn't see the words in the first place. What overlays do often is help you see the words you can't read more clearly. You have to be very, very careful with this. There is snake oil out there. Um, people trying to tell you they can cure reading problems with overlays. There's absolutely no link between overlays and curing reading problems. They will cure seeing problems, but not reading problems. So things like Erlen and so forth are to do with seeing, but they're not going to help a child with their phonological problems. Having said that, going for overlays, um, if your child comes home with a piece of or the worksheet, if you photocopy it uh, onto a, a pastel shade of paper, you may find it helps. But this is because, once again, this is a seeing problem, not a dyslexic problem. And these reading rulers work very well. So let's have a look at this handwriting. <clears throat> I'm sure it looks quite familiar. It looks quite like my son, but he's a doctor, so it's allowed. Um, there's a great temptation to reach for the highlighting, for the, uh, the handwriting pens and the books, but I wouldn't because you can often sort this out in a few seconds flat because this is the, the same child seconds later. And all I did was put a ruler on the line and run the thickness of a highlight pen along that line and then get the child to write again. And that is the difference. That is the immediate difference. Now, what's happened there <clears throat> is that the problem that you see in the top two lines isn't coordinational. It's actually spatial. Where on the line does it go? If you run this highlight line across the, the bottom half of the line, it, it locates the W, the E, the A, the R, the top of the G, um, the bottom of the L, and so on. And it just works a treat. Now, you will see handwriting books with raised lines and this sort of thing. They're absolutely fine. But the beauty of the highlighted line, and please use a ruler when you do it, is you can do it immediately. It's an instant, quick fix. And I'll show you the impact of this. This is some work from a a teacher and a student in Hong Kong. So this is a, a Cantonese speaking uh, dyslexic sec secondary school lad writing English. And as you can see, it's a shambles. He's writing over two lines. It's a mess. And there's not very much about it, good about it at all. Now down the bottom, you will notice that the teacher has put the highlighted line in, has actually written some of Ken's work. And then this is crucial, got Ken to trace over it. This is important because it gives Ken permission to go above the line or below the line, below the line for the Y of U, above the line for the T of mate. So you get this idea of, of, of flow. So Ken has copied, traced over the teacher's writing to get a feel for working within the lines. Now, if you hold in your, in your mind this picture, I'll show you Ken's work tomorrow. Now, the following day, he had an English assessment. So the teacher highlighted up a page of exercise paper for him. Now, when you see the paper, you can't see the lines. They didn't copy, but they're there. So that was yesterday. Today, with no practice, just highlighted lines. How about that? Now, how about that for impact? Ken's writing at length now. Because he can see what he's doing, he's self-correcting. Because it's now looking good, he's writing with pride. He actually believes. So we go back. To, this is a Ken who believes that what he's doing works. And all it takes is those highlighted lines. If your child is perhaps not spacing letters properly or words, uh, words I should say properly, um, <clears throat> we use the finger space thing, which is a bit of a pain to be honest. Blue tack works a treat. Now I got here a bit late with my pen, my, my pen, my, my uh, I say my phone. Um, what the lad had done, he got blobs of blue tack all the way across the top of his page. And then he starts to write once blob upon blob, a blob, time blob, the blob, and so on. When he runs out of blobs, he'll take them all off and carry on. It's very tactile and it works a treat. It just makes the point about how to space out your words. So that's another lovely thing you can do. It also works well for full stops as well because you can use a blue tack full stop and then keep moving it until it's in the right place. And then when it's in the right place, you can make it a real one. So here's a lad who's actually, in terms of homework, he's pretty well set up, isn't he? 
He's got a worksheet that mum and dad have copied onto pastel shade of paper. So he's seeing it more clearly. It won't help him decode it if he can't decode it, but it'll certainly stop not being able to see it being the issue. He's got his highlighted lines. <clears throat> you know what? He is away and he'll get his homework done very quickly in that time. So let's have a look at spelling. What I'm going to try and do in the time we have is look quick look at spelling, uh, look at reading, and a look at getting ideas down on paper. And I was thinking they're probably going to be three of the issues that we deal with with homework. With more time, I would like to include things like um, learning for tests and so on. Maybe we'll do another one. We'll see how we go. So there's um, Charlie Brown. I don't know you've. I hope this is making you smile. I'll let you read it anyway. It certainly works for me. So here's a piece of homework. This is um, an eight-year-old girl. She is dyslexic. And when you look at it <clears throat> as a mom, as a dad, as a teacher, there's a great temptation to home in on everything that's perhaps not quite right. But that would be a shame because actually this is a cracking good piece of work. And there's one word in particular that tells you that this girl is very smart. She's a very smart cookie. Um, <clears throat> and once we sort out the easy stuff, which is the issues with basic skills of the presentation and the spelling, actually, she's going to be a very good writer of history. I wonder if you can find the word that tells you how good she is. I'll leave you to, pardon me, read it. Is it within, it's in that first long sentence, if you can find it. So she writes, the Romans were very good at fighting. They beat almost anyone. They were invincible. Now, how about that for a word when you're eight? Eh? Using a word like invincible, completely in context. And that tells me she's going to be great. Now, she's writing in sentences. She's got a flow of ideas. You know, the only thing she can't do at the moment is, is the spelling and <clears throat> perhaps some of the presentation. Now, and luckily, that's the easy bit because I find myself saying to parents all the time, if you've got a child who can think but who struggles with the basics, don't worry because it's easy to teach a thinking child ultimately to read and spell. It's very hard to teach a reading and spelling child how to think. So once we sort out the basics for this girl, and we will through great teaching, through accommodations, through um, technology as well, she is away. And you'll notice down the left-hand side of her page, these pictures, this is her thinking style. What she's actually doing is storyboarding as she goes. So her doodles in the margin are <clears throat> organizing her thinking. Organizing thinking is not always the best thing for dyslexic learners because they often t they tend to think all, all round a topic and they're not beginning, middle, end thinkers. Her doodles in the margin are enabling her to um, order her thoughts. So <clears throat> from a parental point of view, it's important that we emphasize the positives, we get into the positives and we look at the things that we can celebrate rather than the things that we uh, are worried about. And while I'm on that, you'll notice that she's got a problem with the words like were and so on, but she's doing it consistently. So once we can show her how to spell were, she'll be away. It's always encouraging when you see a word misspelled consistently throughout. We can deal with that. So let's have a look at spelling. And the key with spelling is really to do with syllables and the way that um, big words are broken down into chunks. So photosynthesis is pho, to, sin, the, sis. We over enunciate to make it work. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we're interested in is phonological awareness. And if you're a mum or a dad, you may have come across this phrase before. It's all about being able to manipulate, to segment and blend the sounds into words. Back, you're cutting your words into sound bites. So octopus, octopus is the way that it works. Now you may have come across look, cover, write, check. <clears throat> And what you need to know, of course, is it doesn't work. It's, it's a pointless exercise if it's the only thing you do. Later on, I will <clears throat> make a case for look, cover, write, check to come in at the end of a sequence of activities. But to say to a child, look at a word, cover it, write it, check it, is a waste of their time, a waste of your time. Um, it's probably as pointless as writing out corrections three times. And it's even, you know, writing about 10 times is even worse. So look, cover, write, check, writing out corrections over and over again, these things don't work for our dyslexic learners, our learners on the dyslexia spectrum. What we do know <clears throat> is that we have a visual memory and we have a verbal memory. And these are located and 
contribute to work in the central executive. The only trouble is that things you learn visually tend to be stored in a visual box, if you like, in the central executive. And things you learn verbally tend to be in a verbal box. And they don't really communicate unless <clears throat> you do this, unless you touch it. The minute you turn <clears throat> any learning task into something hands-on, you actually make sure that the visual and the spatial come together and join together and become more than the two parts. So this is a key thing when it comes to supporting our children with spelling. So hands-on spelling <clears throat> is the way to go. So really, mums, dads, you need plastic letters. Now, you can get them. Scrabble is great. <clears throat> get a bag of Scrabble letters. What you'll notice on the right-hand picture, though, is um, all the letters are in a little box. This is a bead box from a craft shop. And this is really important because as your child goes through school, they're going to want to spell more and more complex words. And I can tell you from bitter experience, if you've tried to get a word like photosynthesis out of the bag of Scrabble letters, you've lost the will to live by the time you've found it. However, if your letters are organized in a bead box, <clears throat> you can get them out very quickly. You'll also notice in all these examples, these are uppercase rather than lowercase. And <clears throat> traditionally, we would say it should be lowercase. Uh, pragmatically, it doesn't seem to make any difference at all to older children. By that, I mean probably later key stage one, up to key stage two, three, four. They actually don't care whether it's lowercase or uppercase. In fact, if you shouldn't use uppercase, then nobody should be using a laptop or an iPad. Um, so don't worry, if you, if you can't get lowercase, don't worry, uppercase works just as well. So the, <clears throat> the plastic letters are a very, very important part of what we're going to do. And if we were doing this as a workshop, we'd have all the letters in front of us. You know, we'd have our alphabet arc out <clears throat> and off we would go. And this is what it can look like, what it should look like, a really good organic spelling. This is a picture from one of the workshops that I've been running with parents and children. So... <clears throat> If your child <clears throat> needs to learn a word like hospital, a word like friend, a word like volcano, the key is to choose one of them, let's go for hospital, and give your child the letters in a jumble, okay? And we'll say, okay, we're gonna spell hospital. And what we'll do, we'll go through a little mantra, which is from uh, Mastery Learning. I'm gonna say it, we're gonna say it, you're gonna say it. So I will say hospital, we'll say hospital together, then you will say hospital. And then what I'd like you to do is to make the word hospital. Find the letters, make the sounds, and put it together. Once they've got hospital, we break it. So they make it, and we break it. Do it again, and we break it again. And now we say, okay, can you clap hospital? Can you separate it into its sounds? Okay. Once you've gone through all of this, as many times as your child needs to, you say to your child, are you, are you happy with this? Are you good? Right, now, look, cover, write, check. That's when it comes in. It comes in at the end of a multi-sensory sequence. Friend is a bit more difficult because you've got the fr, which it makes sense, and you've got the ie bit. <clears throat> Friend, logically, should be written E-N-D without the I, but we have the I because this is English and it's crazy. So what we have to do here is say, in the word friend, the I-E combination says eh, fr, and the IE says eh in this, comp in, this, in this setting. This is the work of Professor David Kilpatrick, who will tell us that sight words are not stored visually. They're stored um, as in a phonological sense. Volcano again, vol, k, no, okay. I'll say the word, you say the word. Now you make it, break it up, make it, split it up, keep doing it. When you're ready, make it say vol, k, no, look cover right check you know what it's there and the important thing about it is it'll be there tomorrow as well now in the flow of writing it might get lost but as a exercise spell the word volcano it will be there <clears throat> so that's what it would look like that's the display and now the child will put it all together saying the letter sounds as he puts it together the oh, look a no mess it up do it again mess it up do it again segmented into its sounds, volcano, look, cover, right check. You know what? It's there. So this is the way we do it. And it's fun. And it, it works. The only thing, though, <clears throat> we have to be careful about this, is it takes time. Now, <clears throat> what it means is that if there was, for example, a word list to be learnt, your child will only be able to do so many on the word list within the homework time. 
So what we'll do is we will learn as many words as we can thoroughly within that homework time. And then we email the school or we send a note in and say, we've covered, we've, we've done these six or these five, these four thoroughly. Please just test us on those, will you? And they will. Of course they will. Your teacher would rather have four or five words learnt properly than 10 words learnt to be forgotten. So just communicate and it'll be absolutely fine. And once again, there's a close up of you know, what it will look like. These boxes are fantastic. And as your child gets older and is using subject jargon words properly, as they do, you know, the language of our kids is usually amazing. And at key stage three, two, three, four, pardon me, you know, the word invincible, imagine, you know, e easy to find if you've got it, it the words the bead, in, in the bead box. We do have to be a little bit careful ourselves because how we actually sound words is important and if i got you to sound kitten for me and i said clap it i bet you would go kitten now if we did this they're only going to put one t in that's all they heard they heard kitten so what we have to do is be really careful that if there are two consonants like rabbit we over enunciate so it's rab bit smell lee kitten al lig and so on. And that over enunciation is really important. But we do it, you do it. We say tu es day, wed nes day, pi opal, skyant. We do all that sort of thing. So making sure that we sound the sounds is really important. And then we're linking that, the, the sounds and the symbols together to make it work. So rab bit, there's the finger space. Bin ok you lars. Yeah, easy. Oh, well, there's one. What do you reckon? You see where you would split that? We, we looked. You can see the pair. There's two pairs of double consonants, and that's where the split will go. So it becomes ac, com, mo, de, shun. And what you notice is that the biggest bit is usually no more than three or four letters long. And we can remember three or four letters. It's when it, we start to try and learn the whole lot in one go, it becomes tricky. So once we've done all of that, look up a right check becomes a really valuable tool. Just don't use it until we've done all the work. And we're talking serious words, you know, we're not talking trivial words. Dictator, porcupine, sarcastic, suffocate. Look at that. I mean, these are serious words that your children are using properly in speech all the time. And now we can give them this opportunity to associate the sound pattern, the syllable structure with um, the way it's spelled. In another workshop, we can look at why it is that how you make vowels say the sound you want. How do you make a vowel say i? How do you make a vowel say i? But that's not going to focus of us today. We can do that another time. So <clears throat> I will say it. We will say it. You will say it. I'll clap it. We clap it. You clap it. We'll say the first syllable. Write it down. Watch out for its silent letters. So we say vol, finger space, k, finger space, no. Yeah, that's how we do it. And it's this modeling that we do. That is so so important. Once we've gone through that format, the look, cover, write, check becomes really useful. Excuse me. So if you have any <coughs> queries or ob observations about spelling, um, please use the chat and we'll, we'll look at it um, at the end of this session. So let's think about reading. <coughs> I have to say at the start, that no amount of <clears throat> us reading to our children, no amount of us reading, hearing our children read, will help them learn how to read. Reading doesn't work that way. So and there's been an awful lot of parental shaming going on there on the internet. People saying, oh, you know, if your kid can't read, it must be because you haven't read to them properly. It's, it's, it's disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful. You, the process of learning to read is phonological. Okay, and you know, reading to your child is a lovely thing to do, but it doesn't help them learn to read. It might give them a love of reading, they have a love of books, but it will not deal with those issues. So I have three children, and uh, when I was a dad, I we used to get together, and I used to read a bit to them, and they'd read a bit to me, and I'd read a bit to them, and they'd read a bit to me, and I thought it was lovely, <laughs> and they thought it sucked basically, because they didn't like it. They loved me reading to them. And what they particularly love, and this is the one I'm going to advocate to you, is a thing called paired reading. Now, paired reading is where you and your child 
snuggle down together. And by the way, this is definitely for um, key stage two, key stage three, and with negotiation, key stage four as well. And the idea is that you two read the words together as one voice. So it just sounds like one person reading. It's not you read a bit, I read a bit. It's we read it out loud together in unison, choral reading, if you like. It needs to be initially the child's choice of book. And if you do go down this route, and I hope you will, please don't fall into the trap of saying, oh, that's too easy. Um, what do you read when you're tired? I bet you don't read War and Peace. I certainly don't. I don't read research papers when I'm tired. I read rubbish, probably one step above Mills and Boone, because I'm comfortable with it. So if your child is tired and they want to read something from a while ago, let them read it. The important thing is you read for pleasure. So please don't get this, oh, it's too easy nonsense. That's not the way to go. And then you and your child will read out loud together and you will tell the story with your voice, okay? And you also point to the words. You can stop pointing when the child is in the flow, but as you point, we go. An important principle is you read over any mistakes. So if your child can't read a word, you don't stop, you don't sound it out, you don't do anything, you just carry on. Slow down a bit, keep pointing, and your child will get back into the flow. Comprehension is about flow. And if we stop the flow and try and teach, it's going to spoil it. So we slow down, we point, we carry on regardless, we relax, we enjoy it, and we make it fun. And the lovely thing about paired reading, let me go back a step. Generally speaking, if your child can't read between eight and nine words out of every 10, that book is too hard, okay? And there's, there's no discussion about that. That's just a fact. If your child can't read between eight and nine words out of every 10, they shouldn't be expected to read it unaided. It's too hard. This means then for children who are perfectly capable of understanding a David Williams book, um, Harry Potter, whatever, they will struggle with the decoding because of the language. But the beauty of paired reading is that if you and your child are reading out loud together, it seems to negate this. You, you can actually read a book, which is too hard. And because they're in the flow and because we're queuing it, they're joining in as well. And although they may be making a lot of mistakes, at the end of the day, they will actually absorb it all. They're like little sponges. So if you get a comprehension passage, for example, you have to read a passage, answer the questions. Pair reading the passage first, then pair reading the questions really gets your child into the context. So here's a piece I use a lot. And um, excuse me. If we were to read this together, you and I, we would just start. I would go, right, one, two, three, and I would be pointing. Jack and Richard were cousins. They were also very good friends, and they liked playing together. And it would be in that sort of tone of voice. Now, if my child can't read a word, we have, let, let's start down here. Uh, Jack came to Richard and bought with him his new toy, a aeroplane. Don't worry. Don't worry. Because later on it'll be quite clear what it was uh, and your child being your child will actually oh yeah it was remote control wasn't it yeah because of the way it works now i was doing this piece with a, a group of parents in a workshop and uh, there was a seven-year-old and it was far too hard um, the pair reading was really quite funny because it sounded like this jack jack and and richard richard were were cousins cousins he wasn't actually reading he was repeating what his mum said but at the end of it he got every question right every single question. He got the nuance, the subtlety, the storyline, the lot through paired reading. So paired reading is incredibly powerful. With older children, you may need to do a deal. A very powerful deal is saying, right, I'm prepared to go to town on Saturday with you, and I'm prepared to spend X number of pounds on books. You may choose the books, but the deal is that we will pair read them, okay? And please let your child have a free choice. You may not approve the choice of books. It could be um, comics. It could be comic books. It could be fiction. It could be nonfiction. doesn't matter. If your child wants to read it, then that's part of the battle. But the deal is you will pair read it together. And I think you'll find it very, very rewarding. What we also know about <clears throat> reading is how important it is that your child knows what they're reading and why they're reading it before they read it. If you think about it, you and I, don't read anything unless we want to. We know why we're reading it. 
So this process of metacognition is absolutely essential. What we do know is that um, learners with weak reading skills who know a lot about what they're reading actually do nearly as well in a comprehension as good readers. Knowing a lot about it actually compensates hugely for problems with the basic decoding. Remember what I said, it's much easier to teach a thinking child how to read than a reading child how to think. And so these thinking stems are really powerful at the start of a, re a reading piece. So I'm thinking, I'm wondering what it's about. I'm noticing, I'm picturing all these things, uh, <clears throat> questions that should be going on. So if we have a comprehension activity, maybe with a, uh, a picture and a piece of text, then this is the process we go through first. And if you go onto Google Images, there are hundreds of these that you can actually download. So <clears throat> just, just from that picture, I see, I think, I wonder, we're in a position now to be in the contextual ballpark. It's probably global warming. It's probably about drought, um, implications of drought, blah, 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 yeah. And what it means is that when we come across complicated words that we use in speech, but we struggle to read, it doesn't matter because we'll be able to deal with them. So <clears throat> let's have a look at how we can deal with uh, a piece of work that comes home from school where we've got to answer some questions on it. <clears throat> and I'm gonna invoke what I call TCPQR. This is something I developed oh, 20, 30 years ago when I was teaching. And it's all about bringing in the power of contextualized guessing. Now, I am dead against guessing as a reading activity. It is, should not be <laughs> play any part in what we do. However, if you've been through phonics and you know your phonics, then <clears throat> you can use phonics as a guessing process if you know the context. So if, for example, you're reading Harry Potter, and the word you can't read is the word that refers to the wizard who's in charge of the school. And you go, duh, uh, oh, yeah, it's Dumbledore. That is using phonological guessing, contextualized guessing, using your phonics and your context to deal with a jargon word that you know what it is. You just can't read it at the moment. So TCPQR is the order in which we deal with the comprehension. So the first thing we do <clears throat> is we read the title and we do the metacognitive question stems. I'm thinking, I'm wondering all about the title. Now, 50% of children in a class will not read the title first and they're called boys because we don't. All right, we want to pile straight in. Um, and we missed a lot of tricks this way because what the title often does, excuse me, <clears throat> is get us into this contextual ballpark so that we know what we're reading before we come to read it. Once we've done that, we look at captions and pictures and what the captions and pictures do anything in bold, anything that catches the eye, they either reinforce our theory from the title or they make us think again. But by the time you've done the title, the captions, the pictures, you should know pretty much what you're reading, why you're reading it and what it's going to be about. Do you read it now? No, you don't. Now you read the questions. And the reason you leave the questions till now is that there might be words in the questions that you would perhaps struggle with. But because you know the context, you can usually make this appropriate um, assumption to what they're about. <clears throat> and the final thing now, before we actually start reading it, we see how many questions we can answer before we read the passage. And there's usually two, maybe three, maybe four. If there's a data table, it's often even more than that. So you, can, you find you can often answer possibly half the questions in a comprehension before you read the passage. What this means is then that when you do read the passage, <clears throat> you're reading it from a totally different perspective. You know what it's about, why you're reading it. You've made some guesses, are they right? And so on. So if we do the title, mum and dad, child, with the captions, the pictures, we pair read the questions. We see if we've got any answers. And then we pair read the passage. We pair read the questions again, and we do it. And the hugely important thing here, mum, dad, is that we do the writing. So whatever the question is, Whatever the answer is, whatever your child says, we will do that writing or we'll bang it into our laptop, our iPad. And so at the end of the activity, our child has done the hard bit, which is the thinking. We've done the easy bit, which is the writing. And that speeds up the entire homework process. You need to let the school know you're going to do this. You say, don't, you know, th this will be exactly my child's own words, right or wrong. If your child's wrong, it doesn't matter. Just do it. But this will let you get through the process much more quickly. But you have to be fair. You have to be honest. And if your child says, 
the man what done it, done it good. Well, that's what you type in. You can't say, oh, the man did it extremely well, because that's not fair. If you do do that, we will know. And we will actually get our revenge in the next reporting session because we will write for your child. Susie, Johnny is forging his way steadily ahead. OK, but if you do it honestly and openly, the school will be delighted to receive your child's spoken language in your handwriting. Every now and again, they'll say, no, please don't do that. We, we need it as it as it is. Well, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. But this is the way to do it. Talk to your school. So let's look at it. There's global warming. This is the piece that's come home from school. There's our picture. So we talk about the picture and the title. Now let's look at captions and pictures. So we've got burning fossil fuels. There's our picture. We've got farming. Yep. Causes of global warming. Deforestation. Yep. How climate change will affect wildlife. Yep. And it's at that point that we do, you know, we don't do any reading. So we've done all of that. Now, once we've done that, we can start doing the reading. And once we've done the reading, paired reading, we're in a position then to answer our questions. But the title, the captions, and the pictures get us in superbly in a position where when you do the paired reading, it's making so much, much more sense. If by some chance there are no captions or pictures with older learners, no problem. We do this. We look at the title and it's global warming. We read the opening sentence of each paragraph. We read the closing sentence of each paragraph, and then we think, what do I know already? We go through that metacognitive process. So global warming, imagine the year is somewhere in the future. And the final sentence, scary, right? So that bit that's in the middle is clearly presenting a very, very unhappy, miserable, dystopian picture of the future, sort of Mad Max with knobs on. And if you know that, when you come to do the reading, you're anticipating some of those issues, which are all there in that text. But because you've done the title, first sentence, last sentence, and done that metacognitive stuff, you're in the ballpark. And a lot of these words now make sense because you've come across them before. So very powerful. OK, excuse me. Now, before I get on to the writing, then, what we're saying here <clears throat> is that paired reading is the way to go. And if you can get your child to accept paired reading, uh, when the comprehension comes home from school, do the title, the captions, the pictures, the questions, pair read the questions, see if you can do the questions from your knowledge already, pair read the passage, pair read the questions again, and we will do the writing because we've explained to the school that is how it will be done. We don't ask, by the way, this sounds very arrogant, but you, you, you tell the school that's the way you're going to do it. OK, but the school's going to love it because instead of having um, three questions answered in the allotted span of homework time, they're all going to be done. OK, but play fair, no cheating. OK, so let's think about this. Then. One of the things which typifies learners on the dyslexia spectrum one of the reasons why I love teaching young learners on the dyslexia spectrum is that the imagination is often incredible, not just in fiction, in nonfiction, all the ideas come together. They have great ideas. They can talk a great story, talk a great narrative, but they hate writing it down. And the reason they hate writing it down is because they find it hard and it, it's never as good as it was when it was taught. Luckily, we can fix this. So your child comes home from school, mum, dad, um, we did this stuff and I've got to write uh, a, a newspaper report, let's say, okay? Fine, okay, easy peasy. Now, it seems to me there are three reasons why our guys don't like writing. And it tends to be too many ideas. It's really not enough. It's usually too many. Well, the ideas are bubbling. It's information overload, but they never, ever come out in the right order. So the ideas are coming in willy-nilly. Dyslexic learners are not beginning, middle, end thinkers, as I said before. The, the, it's all there, but it won't come up in that order. So too many ideas, yep. They never come out in the right order, nope. And they can't get started. If we can deal with those three, and we can, then I back myself to get anybody writing. And this sounds arrogant, but as I say, internationally, working in English as a second language as well, 
these techniques really, really work. So what we're going to do first of all is a brainstorm. <clears throat> and this needs to be organized in a, in a very special way. You, adult, you need little post-its, little square ones that are blocked from Tesco's or um, Aster is great. <clears throat> and what you're going to say to your child is, okay, you've got, you've got to write this um, newspaper passage article about uh, plastic pollution, okay? Um, <clears throat> what do you want to say? And the idea will come. And what you do is everything that's said, every point that said, you write on a separate post-it. Now, when I do this in workshops with parents, you often find that the children want the post-its. You get post-it envy. Don't let them have the post-its. Because what we're trying to do is you're trying to, they're trying to, you want them to do the hard bit, which is the ideas. We do the easy bit, which is the writing down. So what we do is we just put one idea on a post-it, stick it on the table, blah, 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 blah. Okay? We do a post-it brainstorm. Now, what this means then... <clears throat> is that it doesn't matter if the ideas don't come out in the right order. Because now we can do a multi-sensory select and order. And remember, multi-sensory, the minute you touch it, then the visual and the verbal come together into a coherent whole. So what we'll now do is we'll use our posters and we'll move them around until they make sense. What we'll probably do is use uh, a mind map um, skeleton, which I'll show you in a minute. The nice thing about using posters is that you can physically move them and change your mind. Many learners on the dyslexia spectrum associate crossing out with failure. So if we do a list format, you've got to cross it out and move it. It's messy. Nobody minds moving a post-it. So you, you say to your child, right, what do you want to say? And they'll tell you everything. Every single piece goes on a separate post-it. They can illustrate the post-its if it helps. By all means, that's absolutely fine. Then we order the post-its. And then what we're going to do is we're going to actually give them some really strong clues about how to get started. Okay, let's make it work. So we do the brainstorm. You're going to do the writing. Shout and stick, shout and stick, shout and stick. As few words as possible on each post-it. Okay, that's what it, and that's what it'll look like. So that's the brainstorm. Your child talks, we write, we stick. Your child's doing the hard bit. They don't think they're doing the hard bit, but they are. We're doing the easy bit. We're just writing down what they say. And then what we're going to do is use a multi-century select and order. And we might use something like this, this little format. Look at this first, next, after that, then finally, also, however. So we've got this newspaper article about global warming. Um, so first will be our first point. Uh, next is the next thing we want to say after that, then. You know what? It writes itself, doesn't it, actually? So if you have that little um, <clears throat> map, and if you printed that out quite small and you stuck it onto a big piece of paper, your child can stick the post-its where they want to go. And then a really wonderful thing happens because as they stick a post-it, a next post-it, whatever it is, I guarantee another idea will occur to them. They go, hang on a minute, and they'll, they'll draw a little line and they'll add something else. So the value becomes added to it as you go. And you can see this happening here. This is a, a, another piece of work. But you can see how the idea is beginning to flow it's remarkable how it happens. This one post-it initially from the brainstorm could trigger three or four more as they go down onto the piece of paper. And now if your child wants to write them on, yeah, by all means, yeah, but I'll leave it up to you. So here we have um, health, health and safety considerations when doing a scientific experiment. And we're gonna use the first, next, after that format. And we'll brainstorm them all. <clears throat> okay, your child comes home. I've got, we've got to do this for science, okay? Brainstorm it all, sequence it, and then add some value, and it's going to work beautifully. I like mind maps. <clears throat> um, the reason I like mind maps is because you can keep adding information as you go. And as I said before, new ideas come. So initially, you've got ideas on the post-its, and all of a sudden, other stuff pops up from imagination, knowledge, and context. So we've dealt with um, too many ideas. We've dealt with never come out in the right order. Now we've got to deal with I can't get started. Now what I'm whizzing through in 15, 20 minutes is in fact a half day workshop on writing skills. Um, the last time I did this, I think it was, it was in, in, New, in New Zealand from my table uh, a few weeks ago. So we are galloping through somewhat, but I hope the ideas are helping. So now we're going to deal with can't get started. And if you haven't come across peels, then they're worth a look. If you Google peel plus writing or peel plus literacy, 
then you'll get into this. The idea of peel is that a paragraph should have a point, some evidence, an explanation, and a link, and it, it, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. And what they're giving you is, is some words and phrases to get started. It's not easy to use appeal. And in fact, what we need to do as mums and dads really is help our child get through this because often you get too much information. What I tend to do then is, is whatever I'm doing the writing of, I will um, choose the starters I think are appropriate. And then what I'm going to do, because you'll gather by now, I believe in multisensory learning, I'm going to cut them up so that my child can move them around. So you imagine that, that mind map first, next, after that. First, some people would argue, okay? And the evidence clearly shows this explains that. And, and there's a paragraph, it's come together. And because we've got these phrases on bits of paper or stickies for that matter, you could do it on post-its if you wish, then it works. So do have a look at peels. If you struggle yourself with getting stuff started, you're gonna find it really helpful. And it certainly improved my own writing, my writing, and it may well improve yours as well. So these are powerful. All I've done here then is decided, well, and I'm going to go for three points, three explanations, three evidence, three link. I'll cut them up. We can drop them onto our map in the right place. And all of a sudden, it's beginning to work. So <clears throat> here we have uh, our act, sort of activity thing. Huh? As we look down, the first thing we could see was a gigantic erupting volcano which exploded like an angry teacher. And this has all come from our stuff. And we can go down the first, next, however, suddenly, whatever, route. You don't have to use all of them. You pick the ones you like. You pick the ones that work. And it begins to make it flow. So we've talked about first we, we saw. Next, th this is a, um, a space shuttle activity, the writing activity I do and we're, we're exploring a hidden planet. Next, we flew across a deadly desert and we'll explain it. After that, also suddenly, and there you have, you know, you have the essence of a really good story all coming from that initial brainstorm. Once we've got that, the key thing here is to talk it. And you may have heard of talk for writing, which is Pi Corbett's great gift to education. Um, if your school does talk for writing, they will probably spend a week in putting all this together. I do it slightly differently. I get my groups writing within an hour lesson. And the reason is that the learners I work with have forgotten what they've done by the end of the week. So in, in, <coughs> excuse me, in an hour, I would expect everybody to be on paragraph one by the time I've, you know, by the time I finished. And this is um, seven year olds upwards. The talking is critical, and I'll show you what I mean. So here we have uh, a mind map, really quite a, a nice one here. As we came through the clouds, we could see, that's the starter I actually gave. I gave the group that starter. I said, look, use it or not, up to you. As we came through the clouds, the first thing we could see far in the distance was an aromatic gleaming McDonald's sign. It looked like the golden gates to heaven. We were hungry after months and months in space, so we engaged our thrusters and hurtled towards the sign. As we got closer, our thrusters threw up a suffocating mist of dust. Now, most of those words aren't there. The extra words are coming from my imagination because I've got the post-its and I've got the extra bits. And your child will be the same. Because we're not overloading them with stuff, you just say, well, go on, tell me the story. And then the critical thing is, as they're telling the story, you and I, we write it down. And that's what's going to go back for homework. Because that, again, is your child's language pattern. Excuse me. So whatever your child says, we write down. If it's not grammatic, it doesn't matter. Just, just write it. Write that story as it is. And it'll be done quickly. It'll be done nicely. It could be that newspaper article on um, global warming, whatever they have to do. You write it. And that's what goes back to school. And it will not be a problem. If your child is using speech to text technology, you know, it's exactly the same. Your child talks, the technology, the app will write it for them. All we're doing, you can do it that way by all means, or you can um, write it for them. Once you've done that, 
and it's quite a skill. You say, go on, tell me all the things you want to say, and this wonderful story will, will emerge. Um, when I do this with in, in a workshop, you often see parents shaking their hands because their children have, have talked three quarters of a side of A4 in no time at all from this sort of a format. Their ideas are just bubbling out. The sequence has been created by the post-it notes and their imagination just runs riot. So if I try and put a summary on this because I'm gonna finish, my hot tip at the start was to talk to your school, work out how long homework should last, and then make sure that you do the deal with your child, which is whatever it is, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes per subject, that amount of quality time means you stop and you move on to the next bit. You've talked to the school, the school understands, absolutely fine. If your child plays on this a bit, if they spend five minutes looking for their pen, well, that, that five minutes is added on and that's the deal and it doesn't take long. We've talked about the importance of spelling, the importance of hands-on. The best way to teach spelling is to give your children the plastic letters in a jumble. They will then rebuild the word and they usually get it right, they really will. Uh, you can then split it up into its sounds, our clappy sounds, put it back together again, mud it up, do that several times. Then we look, we cover, we write, and we check. And it's in because we're using a visual channel, a verbal channel, and a kinesthetic channel. And we're talking serious words. We're not talking trivial words. In fact, big words are easier than little words because big words have shape. The hard words to spell are here, there, they, was. They're the tough ones. So the big ones, much easier. We then come to paired reading. And I said, it's the child's choice of book. You and your child snuggle down together and you read it out loud together as one voice. If there's a mistake, you read over it. And we use that technique when it comes to comprehensions, because what we're going to do is we're gonna look at the title first and talk about the title. We can look at any captions, any pictures and either validate our view of the title or disagree with it. Then we pair read the questions. Then we pair read the reading. We pair read the questions again, and we write down the answers for our child. Warts and all, good or bad. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Write it down, doesn't matter. And then finally, we come to the writing. And the issue with our writing is generally, it's too many, too many ideas at once. So we're going to use this post-it brainstorm. Remember, your child does the thinking, and we do the writing. One idea per post-it. We can then sort it out into some sort of order or shape. And we might want to use uh, a framework like first, next, after that, then finally use appeal maybe to give you ideas. Because then once we've got it in some sort of shape or order, we need the phrases to start the writing. And when you've done that, I think you'll be amazed at the quality of the writing. So this comes from my book, Taking the Hell Out of Homework, um, Working with Your Child at Home. If you as a parent group or uh, perhaps as a teacher of school think that this, this workshop would be of interest to you, pl uh, please get in touch and it'll be my pleasure to discuss how we can do it. Um, it can work at distance, it can work face to face, uh, whatever. So I'm gonna stop now. And what I do hope is that we have some questions and answers or yeah, questions and answers. You've got the questions. Hopefully I've got the answers and we'll see what we come up with. So I can see six up there at the moment. So let's see what we've got. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, we do have um, some in the Q&A and in the chat. So um, if you want to, we've got a few minutes. If you want to pick a well, few, let's, that would be great. Let's Thank start you. from the top, shall we? Um, I'm not very good at sounding words phonetically. Are there any apps to help with this? Now, I, I don't know the answer to this. If anybody knows the answer, can you get it in? Um, the, I, I respect this hugely. One of the issues I think, and I've come across this overseas, is that, um, you only have one sound in a syllable. So we're thinking, we're thinking about syllables. Think about a word like hospital, okay? Hospital has to be three because you've got a hoss, you've got a pit, and you've got an owl. So the, the basic rules of phonological or, or chunking is that only one sound in a syllable. And usually there, there will be a vowel in a syllable or a vowel sound in a syllable. Put those two together and you're away. I don't think that's a great answer. So if anybody knows of an app, please let us know. Um, how do you get a child to spell comb? Great one. So what you've got in comb is you've got the, it's in fact, it's, it's, a, it's all one word, comb. Um, we need to do a little bit of work on this, explaining that we have in English, we have this peculiar B at the end of it. So it, it's, it's the B 
that stops it saying com. If you take the B out, it says com, doesn't it? Okay. So there's com. When you put the B on, it says comb. So you need the B to make the O say O. A bit like you need the, it would be to make the uh, O say O in a word like, um, well, my, my mind's gone absolutely blank. Um, can't think of one. Tone would do, yeah. Ton, put the E on, it says tone. Here the B is acting like the E. And what I would do then, I would give the child the M, the B, the O and the C and say, right, go on, make me comb. Okay, muddle it up, do it again, muddle it up, do it again, as we've described. And I think you will find that that works. What is absolutely clear is that you do not learn sight words visually. And the years I've spent highlighting vowels, drawing boxes around the words have been an absolute total waste of time. The child has to associate the letters with the sounds. And in this one, as I say, the point is that the B here is acting on the O, it's making the O say O, and that's how it works. How can we help students who are in high school with spelling? Well, this is where I come from. Everything I've done with you has really initially come from high school and then into primary. Um, <clears throat> What I don't want my secondary students to do is compromise their language for their spelling. Um, despite the best attempts of our government, um, you still get more marks for great language spelt right than rubbish spelt wrongly. So the feline reclined on the Persian carpet with spelling mistakes is still gonna be worth more than the cat sat on the mat spelt right. So um, from that point of view, I think it's important to be quite careful what you mark. Um, boys in particular, we're very smart. And if we discover that if we write a lot, we end up with a lot of corrections, then we won't write very much next time. So um, how we correct is key. There's a very, very good piece of work from the uh, Education Endowment Foundation, EEF, on marking and so on. And what it is showing very clearly, and I have a look at it, 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 it I, I build it into my presentations now, is that the most useless thing we can do is write the word over the top for them to look at. It doesn't work at all. They don't look at it. Um, if it's the best thing we can do is draw their attention to it with some guidelines and so on. So um, you draw the attention to the issue and say, you know, you might say you've got all the right letters in the wrong order. You're one letter out. You're a vowel out. You're a consonant out. Um, please, can you change it? Please don't say use a dictionary. Um, dictionaries suck basically. Dictionaries only work if you can spell. So if you think a giraffe begins with a J, and why not? A dictionary is going to break your heart. So be very, very careful what you mark. If, again, from a whole school point of view, uh, I go into secondary schools, I'm going to one fairly, recent, fairly soon again, and I'll be talking about spelling. And what I'll be basically saying is that subjects, you are responsible for teaching the spelling of your jargon words. Okay, it's not the special needs department, not the English department, photosynthesis, volcano, uh, tectonic, they're your responsibility, uh, hypotenuse, your responsibility. What I will teach you to do is how to do it. Now, the techniques I've been using have worked superbly. They come from secondary school, and I have found learners willing to use them. And I've even found sixth form. A sixth form was with dot who, who know their spelling is dodgy, who know it's important that they spell polyunsaturated correctly, are prepared to use these techniques. But you do have to do a bit of schmoozing uh, on the way. What do we do about a child who's a poor reader and a poor thinker? This is what um, people would say is uh, your co common or garden poor reader. Um, I think what I would do here is uh, I would definitely suspend my poor thinking for a little bit. And what I would do is I would make sure that what my child is reading is accessible at the um, 8.5 words, accurate words reading. So whatever your child is reading, excuse me for a minute, set them up to succeed with uh, a passage that they can read at eight and a half words out of 10 accuracy. While you're doing that then, I think pair reading is gonna be hugely helpful. I think you might be surprised how much, how well they can work in a paired reading setting. And then I think you need to go, you need to go on to Google Images and get those uh, metacognitive question stems and start applying those before you read. Have a look at the, I'm going to call it the baseball study. I didn't drop it into this presentation, but the baseball study in America is just this. And what it did was it had four groups of learners and it had um, one group were good readers with a good knowledge of baseball. 
One group were poor readers with a good knowledge of baseball, good readers with limited knowledge of baseball, and another group. And at the end of the activity, at the end of the assessment period, the poor readers who knew a lot about baseball did nearly as well as the good readers. And they did better than the good readers who didn't know much. So setting your child up totally in the contextual ballpark before you come to do the reading is going to be hugely helpful. And I think put that together with paired reading and I think it'll work. Right. Um, a question here about maths. No, I don't do maths. You need to look at Steve Chin, um, particularly anything by Professor Steve Chin will be the place to go, the problem with maths and so on. Um, if you Google um, SEN books in Wakefield um, and you get in touch with Colin Redman, who is also publishes my books, uh, perhaps say you've, you've been on a webinar with me and you want to know about uh, some of Steve's books, then please, uh, he'll help you. It'll be great. Thank you so much, Neil. I think we are, we're going to have to wrap things up now. We have run out of time. Okay. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. I think there'll be some great some questions coming in great and questions, um, we could actually do a whole nother session on just these questions. <laughs> um, but um, we will let everybody go and I just just some great tips and advice. It's been really, really helpful and some great comments coming in already. Um, but no, yeah, thank you, Neil. I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that um, to keep an eye on the website and our social media because um, so we can continue to provide uh, help and support. Um, and thank you so much for an amazing presentation. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We hope it's been really, really useful. Um, and yeah, and keep an eye on the website for, for more webinars coming up shortly. So thank you everybody. Um, stay safe and take care. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Good Neil. night everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.